and I'll pass it now over to our hero, where is Dr. Stan Crook, um, to give his opening remarks. There he is. Oh, hero. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have been called many things before I speak, but I think this may be the first uh, time I've been called a hero before I speak. Uh, and I, I suppose I should begin with a, a, a confession of sorts. Um, I didn't want to call this meeting an annual meeting because it has such a corporate sound to it. So I coined the term nanorare patient colloquium, but then promptly realized I couldn't pronounce that word. Uh, and, then, and then I learned that I couldn't remember how to spell it. And then I learned that almost everyone who worked for me at, at Norm couldn't pronounce that word. And so we've been, we've been practicing. And so uh, if, if there's anyone in the audience who has trouble saying that word, um, <clears throat> I thought about bringing some marbles, you know, Demosthenes or whatever it was in the Greek order who used stones, but I thought the um, liability of that might be just a little much. And so my plan is to, or my plan was, to have you, thank you, have you uh, practice during lunch, but uh, that got me bopped on the arm by Roseanne for having another dumb, messy idea. So we'll get rid of that idea. So if, if, if you want to practice, you just have to do it on your own, okay? So uh, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Um, we're thrilled with the uh, level of interest. Um, we're delighted to see so many uh, people here in person and even more uh, joining us remotely. And I'm particularly thrilled to see so many patients and families who've made difficult journeys for them to, to be here today. And, and you're why, we're, why we come to work every day. And so it's wonderful to see you. Um, we have um, an informative and I think a really uh, exciting day planned for you. But before uh, we start that, I do want to thank Chris and all of our wonderful friends and colleagues at Biogen for all the support they've given us from inception. Biogen was a founding donor, and, and they've uh, really worked uh, tirelessly. That's a strange expression, isn't it? You work until you're really tired, actually. Talk to anyone but Ed and Lauren, we know about being tired. But they've worked very hard to help us do this, and we thank you very much, Chris, and, and the entire team. So um, we have um, a lot that we want to accomplish today. We, we want to share um, uh, what our aspirations are, what we hope to accomplish long term with you, uh, the quality systems that we've put in place that are working to assure that every step is conducted with the maximum and quality that we can generate, um, the progress that we've made. And we think, uh, we hope that you agree at the end of the day that the progress that we've made is, is really pretty extraordinary. We're certainly excited about it. And to share what we're learning. And what we're learning already is um, really important. And what we're going to learn will change the way we think about health and disease altogether. And it's time that we do that. And we'll be talking about that as the day goes on. But Enlorum exists for one reason, and that is our patients. Uh, and so we're also here to listen. And uh, we had a wonderful reception last night, and I got to listen to a lot of people. And all of the folks at Enlorum uh, here today are here to listen. So we're anxious to hear what we're doing well, what you'd like us to do more of, uh, and what you'd like to, like to see from us. So we're here to listen. Um, we're here to celebrate. Uh, we think at the end of four years, we have a great deal of success that we want to share with you. And we hope that you, at the end of the day, feel as good about how far we've come um, with this endeavor, beginning with essentially nothing uh, at the beginning of COVID to where we are today. We think, we think it's worth celebrating. Uh, we want to um, especially focus on uh, those first patients who take, take a, an experimental medicine. Those of us who do drug discovery and development uh, as a calling, which I think most people in our industry would say they do it be because of a need to do it, uh, we understand 
the extraordinary importance that the first patient who takes an experimental medicine, uh, that, that the position that that patient occupies. And we want to share, or I want to share with you, uh, a bit of why you, we want to celebrate our, what, we, what I'm thinking of as our pioneer patients and families. Uh, we, we link that, that this day is another opportunity to bring the community together and to create a truly unified, cohesive, empathetic, knowledgeable community. And we think if we couple a unified patient community that's unified in knowledge, uh, then there's really nothing that we can't accomplish together. And based on what I've already seen, I think we may have already achieved that, but there's more to do. And though we are celebrating our successes, we're celebrating a beginning. And so there's a lot more to do. And, um, and so we need to get your support from every single person and every person you know we can't do this alone. We haven't done it alone to this point, and the challenges ahead of us are larger. So we're asking for your help. Uh, <clears throat> and um, we want to recall why we are celebrating, and it's about hope. It's about providing hope to the hopeless in real opportunity for help. So this, this day is about hope and the creation of futures where futures didn't exist. We'll be talking about futures. Uh, fortunately uh, for me, my job is a little simpler. Uh, I do want to give you a very high level summary of what we're learning and what we're doing. And Lori, uh, 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 Julie, Lori, uh, Amy, and Sarah will give you much more detail. At the end of the day, we want you to walk out of here knowing what we do every day and knowing the challenges we face and having a better understanding of the process that we use so that, so that you can understand uh, why the process that we've put together is so important. There are some questions and issues that have arisen. I want to address a few of them. And of course, in Q&A, we'll have more opportunity to do that. I get the pleasure of celebrating our pioneer patients and pioneer families. And I'm going to ask that you join me in that. Uh, and um, a little later in the day, I want to talk about reforms. Reforms don't happen easily. And there are some reforms that are desperately needed. And so we're going to want every single person to put your shoulder to the wheel with us to help us drive these reforms. So we'll be talking a lot about that. Um, and uh, really bringing the group together. When, when, when I began this, I realized that if you're an N of one, there is no community. There is no one to turn to, no one to say, what's going to happen next? Where do I go? How do I get help? And one of the things I'm proud of is this room, that there is coming together a community of the Nana Rare, uh, where none existed in just in four years ago. There is today. And there will be a bigger and more cohesive, more knowledgeable community uh, in, in the coming years. So in, in the end, this is about a dream that was impossible. Everyone said it was impossible until we showed that it was entirely possible. And dreams are what we do. As a, as a family of human beings, we dream collectively and collective dreams can be turned to reality. That's what we're about. Everybody knows our mission, uh, and that is to take advantage of the technology that was created under my leadership at IONIS to, pro to discover, develop, manufacture, and provide the highest quality possible personalized experimental ASOs to patients with nanorare disease and to provide those for free for life. Uh, so, um, what's really uh, something that's very, very important to me personally and to everyone at NLORM is a commitment to equitable distribution of health care. Certainly, we want the services we provide to be needs-based, not means-based. 
So we are categorically uninterested in the financial means of our patients. We don't want to know. No, the application doesn't ask, do you have the money to pay for this? That's our job. We don't think patients and parents should have to be out raising money to be cared for, not in the 21st century in America. That's simply wrong. Uh, we do uh, take what we call directed uh, research donations. And these are really important to us, and we thank our directed research donors. They provide an opportunity to do basic work that, that we couldn't afford to do otherwise. They improve our infrastructure. And we've been tremendously impressed with the generosity of our directed uh, donors in that we ask them to provide donations to the general fund as well as to their area of interest. And they've all been delighted to do that. And I've been asked, do we prioritize patients? No, we don't. We don't. The only prioritization that we engage in is based on urgency of need. So if a patient is progressing rapidly to succumb to the disease or losing an organ, that patient rises to the top. Otherwise, we think all patients should be treated equally. All patients are suffering. All patients deserve to be treated. And LORM is going to do it that way. We don't prioritize. Uh, uh, I do think that we need to better parse patient populations, particularly down at the lower end of the spectrum, because they're different, and they require different solutions. And I've defined nanorare mutations as mutations that have a known prevalence of, of as many as 30 patients in the world. And there's nothing magic about 30. It could be 25, 35. But I felt that people needed a hard number. Uh, what really matters is in that number range, no commercial solution is available today. Also, if you think through it, generally, um, <clears throat> at the most, right now, 10% of a patient population will make their way to us in a way that we can treat. And we can afford, uh, as a nonprofit, to treat three, maybe even four patients for life with the same ASO. And so there's a logic to that 30. And these patients, and of course all of you know this, uh, <clears throat> have one unique advantage, and that is they have an identifiable, understandable, single gene mutation that is driving these enormous phenotypic changes from health to terrible disease. Uh, and of course, once we know the genetic cause, we make a genetic medicine, we have all the information we need. So many of our patients don't have named diseases and we don't care. Uh, we know the cause of the disease, that's our job to fix it. Uh, beyond that though, uh, nanorare patients uh, are extraordinarily disadvantaged. They're by definition the rarest patient population. We didn't know until genomic sequencing that such patients existed, now we know. Uh, they are isolated, they're desperate, the vast majority of patients are never diagnosed, they progress in their disease, succumb without ever knowing why their lives are shorter, why their lives are less robust than the lives they see around them. And those who are fortunate enough to be diagnosed today are in for a long perilous journey replete with misreferrals, misdiagnoses, and far too often mistreatments that make things worse. We have to do something about that. And there is no other option today other than ASOs on an industrial scale for these patients. And so we're it. And we are pioneering a new model. And that means that every step that we take is a step into the unknown. But that's the nature of doing something nobody's done before. And I'm very comfortable at the frontier. We are at the frontiers of medicine and, med and science. And that's a great place to be. In January of this year, and you'll be seeing quite a bit of data from this, uh, we did a data cutoff. And at that time, we had processed 173 applications. 173 applications, that's 173 human beings with terrible disease, 173 families that are desperately seeking an answer. Uh, and so we have our own data now. And, uh, the average time in our patient population in January from symptom onset to diagnosis is four and a half years, roughly. But what really matters is the range. And the range is one month <laughs> to 36 years. And that tells you that these journeys are idiosyncratic, 
They're dependent on factors that patients and families have no control over. And that's something that we have to do something about. But those are numbers, um, and these are personal journeys. And so I will share with you uh, a patient, our very first patient, um, patient we know very, very well, uh, patient 001, uh, his history. And this patient is typical of the patients we see every day, except that his mother very diligently compiled the most impressive natural history I've, I've seen. Like most of our patients, uh, patient 001 was a product of normal gestation, normal, more, normal delivery. But very quickly, the parents realized something was wrong. A uh, patient was hospitalized the first time when he was a month old for severe gastrointestinal distress, for inability to feed, and then one of those terrible terms that we use in medicine, failure to thrive. Um, when I say that, it sort of makes me cringe um, to think about what that actually means. He was worked up thoroughly for his gastrointestinal disease. No cause was found, treated with omeprazole, tagamet, and, and, and the like, and sent home. Eight months, he had his first seizure by age two. His seizures were so intractable that he was placed in hospice care. And then in common with a lot of our patients, his seizures declined. We'll talk about that quite a bit in the, in the, in the coming minutes. Um, he's been hospitalized 29 times in nine institutions. He said 33 incorrect diagnoses and one correct diagnosis. As an infant and toddler, he was treated with as many as 12 to 15 drugs at the same time, almost guaranteeing deleterious drug-drug interactions. And he demonstrates something else that we see a lot. And that is, there was an intense push to care for this child as an infant and a toddler. And then it seems that the medical system seems to weary or, or tire, I don't know. But we see these patients who then are basically not cared for. And he's to a large extent not been cared for by the medical community. He's now 13. His seizures are a minor component of his problems. His major problems are movement disorders, developmental delays, and he continues to have gastrointestinal issues. And we'll come back and talk about that as well. And so we see these things that where phenotypes change. And I refer to that as phenotype drift. We'll come back and talk about that. His journey to diagnosis was far too common. His parents um, found, eventually, knocking on doors, investigator who would sequence him. They got the sequence information, didn't know what it meant. So then they found another investigator to sort out what that actually meant. That investigator turns out to be in Australia. Uh, and since we took this patient, it's been very challenging to find an institution and a physician who would take care of him on an experimental ASO. And fortunately, Rady Children's at UCSD has, uh, has agreed to care for this child and we'll be treating him very soon. And so it's been a long, long trip, uh, but we're thrilled to be in a position where we can begin to see if we can help this child. That's the journey, and we must do something about that journey. Okay. Uh, and, and innocence is able to do this because of its properties. And I won't walk you through these properties other than to say one of the most important features of innocence is that within a chemical class, ASOs differ only in genetic zip code that we use to target the site in an, in an RNA. And so what we learn about one applies to all. And, and that is a critical piece of, of the puzzle for us. And the fact that at Ionis, uh, we've treated uh, certainly more than a quarter of a million patients. And so we have a tremendous experience that we call on to do this the right way at NLARM. Uh, but we couldn't do that were not for the cooperation of the FDA. And in astonishingly rapid order, um, they issued special guidance for ASOs for the nanorare patient population. And during the uh, public comment phase, I made a lot of different, or we made a lot of different recommendations, and many of those were adopted in this final guidance. And so it's that combination of technology and regulatory support that makes this all possible. And we believe that that is an incredibly important model. Uh, as we think about other rare patient populations, how can we put together a provider, a technology, and regulatory commitment to that 
to that patient population. We think this is a model that should be emulated. Uh, we are industrializing the process. That means that we have systems in place that you'll be hearing a lot about that assure highest quality at every step in the process, that establish a process so that we learn maximally from each patient. We owe that to them. And these are extraordinary opportunities to learn in the right model, a human model with a single variable. Um, and, um, and, and that these patients are managed professionally while being treated with an experimental medicine. They are being treated with an experimental medicine. There is a responsibility that comes with that. And we are very committed to that. And of course, uh, we know we can scale this if we can raise the money. Um, technology is fully capable of doing that. That's industrialization. These are the organs we're willing to treat. Why these organs, routes of administration, these are the organs we know. We have extremely high potency, long duration, great therapeutic index, and we believe we can do it properly. Uh, on the right is the amount of drug per patient. And so I'm making a, a, the smallest batch we can make in GMP is about 10 grams. And very often then, that means that we can treat a patient for life with one manufacturing run. And, and, and that makes it economically feasible for us. This is the process that we have in place. I'm just going to touch on this process at a high level, but in, in subsequent presentations, we'll break down each step for you so that you understand at the end of the day all the things that we do, why it takes time, and what the challenges we face, and why it has to be done this way. Um, this is um, a table um, that I've shown in many presentations, it's published. It's the current screening process to identify an optimal ASO for central nervous system disease. And it is multi-step, it's complex, it's cumbersome, it's time consuming, and it's costly. But the points that I want to make on this table is that every one of these steps is a minimum step that's a product of millions of ASO experience. If we thought we could remove any one of these steps, we would. We can't. This is what we need to do today. The number of ASOs at each point are minima as, that are a product of 30 plus years of experience. If you cut a step out, if you reduce the number of ASOs at any step, you increase the risk that you have a suboptimal ASO. And that's something you don't want to do. And finally, over here is what we measure and the minimum criteria. Uh, and again, that's experience-based. These are the product of all the experience that we have with this technology. That's what we do, that's what we must do, and that's what we keep encouraging others who may be providing ASOs to do and do a more thorough job. Uh, Julie will be sharing with you um, each step in much more detail so that at the end of the day, you'll really have a much better understanding of that. Uh, the demand has greatly exceeded anything I dreamt about. I thought maybe by now we'd have a handful of patients. We just have processed more than 225 patient applications. We have accepted about 100 patients. So the simplest way to think of us is that we're a four-year-old biotech company with about 90 drug discovery programs, 70 drugs in development. And in the last year, we filed nine INDs, nine INDs. Uh, and we hope to file a couple more before the end of the year. And so um, it, it, put in that context, it's remarkable what's been achieved. And um, I, I suppose the only thing that separates us from other biotech companies is we're deliberately non-profitable. <laughs> there are plenty of non-profitable biotech companies, but not by, by design. We are. Um, and uh, these nine INDs we filed are with four different divisions of the FDA, two neurology divisions, the eye and cardiorenal. That's important because guidance issues, but not always do the divisions follow the guidance. Here we have had strong support from all the divisions of the FDA, and that speaks um, I think to the quality of the technology and to the desperation of the need and the fact that the FDA recognizes it. 
uh, we've had to expand much more rapidly than I expected to meet this need. And one of the things that I was really worried about when I founded Enlarm is, will we be able to compete for talent? We're competing against biotech companies and pharma who can offer better compensation, uh, RSUs, options, things we can't. Uh, but I have to say that the senior team we have at Enlarm that you've met is as strong and cohesive a senior team as I've ever had. They're here for the same reason I'm here, the reason you're here, the mission. And so the mission recruits. We, it's, it's pretty easy, actually. Uh, we have expanded our laboratory, uh, brought in a new research leader, and that increases our capacity by at least fourfold. And so uh, as next year unfurls, we hope to work through this backlog that we have and, and be able to treat more patients. Today, uh, our only limitation is the dollars we raise. And we couldn't have done that without the extraordinary outpouring of support. Uh, and this table grows every day. We just added Takeda and Hong Jeans as supporters and partners. And you can see it comes from a range of organizations and people and individuals. Uh, and again, I think that speaks to the mission. People want to see this mission achieved. And, and, and what we need at the end of the day is every one of you going out and talking to folks about our mission and how much we need everyone's support. We couldn't do it without you. The other big worry I had uh, was would we be able to help any of these patients since they're all likely so advanced before we get a chance to treat them today? And today we have resoundingly positive answers for that. And that's extraordinary to me in just such a short time. I'll show you two videos. Lori will spend some time talking with you about other potential examples of benefit that we're already seeing. This is Anna. She's a Neil Snyder's patient at Columbia. He's here. Anna has a very aggressive form of, of ALS called FUS ALS. Uh, by, she had progressed significantly before we could get the ASO to her. Uh, she was largely bed fast, required ventilatory support. She rapidly got better, went home, and then as ALS patients do, as I'm, I've been taught, uh, she had a swallowing accident, actually had to be resuscitated, and so the video that you will see here is of Anna after being resuscitated. Here's Anna. A diagnosis after her resuscitation, after induction uh, doses. Her golden retriever saying hi. Uh, here she's showing recovery of fine motor skills, which the ALS experts tell me is really impressive. Uh, after another dose in the summer, climbing stairs, slowly. She has to stop here to catch her breath. Another dose in the fall. Later in the year, ever stronger, able to rise and walk rapidly. And then this year, she's going downstairs. It takes different muscles and different coordination. Um, <clears throat> she, in short, is alive, breathing on her own, walking, talking, enjoying her family. She has a future where none existed. And her family has a future that at, at worst includes much more time with their daughter and at best, maybe a future without an unfillable hole in their heart. We think that's worth doing. We think that's really worth doing. So that's on them. Um, I want to talk to you about what we're learning. In, as I said, in January, we, we did a data cutoff. The database is heavily skewed to neurological patients, but we're now getting eye and liver and kidney cases, and so that's going to change. But just remember that as we go through here. Of the 173 applications, we were able to accept 78. We have 14 on hold. That means an application didn't have all the information we needed to make a decision. And so we're working hard to reduce that uh, inefficiency. 
Over on this slide, uh, uh, side of the slide, is an important uh, pie chart. It's not simply diseases of infants and children. We have 48 of our 173 patients, over 18, and our oldest patient is 69. So it's a disease, a set of diseases that happen at all ages. Uh, this is just a set of gene families. Um, not surprisingly, if there's a gene family that's important, it can have a nanorare mutation and it can cause severe disease. Notice that we have 26 different ion channel mutations. And that just speaks to the fact that the brain is an electrical organ. And, and, and these patients share many things in common. And one of them is that many of them seem to have severe GI and GU issues. And to date, we see no evidence that anyone has asked, could there be a central component that's contributing to that, an autonomic component to that disease? We at least think we should be asking that question. Uh, this is the type of, of mutations that we see. Lots of toxic gain of function, some mixed, uh, but uh, other types of mutations as well. So we need to know what the mutation is, but we also need to know what kind of mutation it is, and we have to be confident that the mutation actually is disease-causing. Uh, this looks at uh, the design of the ASOs, and not surprisingly, uh, uh, we have 53 of the 78 patients we accepted that require allele-selective ASOs. That means they have a heterogeneous mutation. One copy of the gene is mutated, the other is not. The gene ha produces a protein that has an important function. And so we have to design ASOs that can reduce the mutated RNA and the mutated protein and leave the normal uh, uh, alone. That takes some work, uh, but I think next year, I, I think we can, we can learn how to do this much better thanks to some recent advances. And so next year, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to address that and begin to do a much better job with that. Some basic research that I want to do. We have uh, 16 mutations where we have more than one patient with the same mutation. And we have eight of those where we have sufficient phenotypic and natural history data that we can ask simple questions. Like if you have the same mutation, do you have the same syndrome? And not surprisingly, the answer is no. People are different. But we have now, for the first time, a genotype, a phenotype, and a patient that we can then begin to ask why. Here's a, a two patients about the same age who have mutation, a, a, the same missense mutation in a signaling protein, an alpha subunit of a G protein. And you can see that they share a, a, a lot of phenotype, but one child is progressing toward blindness, the other is not at all. And so we now can begin to ask in these very patients, the patients who matter, human beings, why? What makes these patients different? Uh, this is a, a, a pair of patients who have a mutation in uh, a histone. Histones regulate a lot of gene function, so you'd expect a very severe phenotype, and they do have that. But here you can see uh, one of these patients actually has a lot of structural bony deformities. The other has none. Uh, again, multiple examples of that. Um, and, and, and we think that that becomes a true treasure of, of opportunity to begin to learn about health and disease and how health progresses to disease. And particularly as we treat and we have the opportunity to watch the reverse ontogeny of that disease if, if we produce benefit. And so these are extraordinary opportunities to learn and our goal is to learn and to share with what we're learning. We believe that if with an optimal ASO dosed appropriately, we should be able to avoid severe adverse events and most ad drug-related adverse events. To date, as Lori will show you, we have no drug-related adverse events. Uh, and, and that's our goal. We cannot add side effects to the burdens that these patients already live with. Um, so what did we learn? Well, one, we've learned that this journey to diagnosis must be addressed. We can't have this continue. It's wrong. We know that the systems that we put in place to assure quality are working. And we commend them to you and we'll be teaching you about them as the day progresses. We know 
that the, our approach to understanding and learning from these patients is working. Uh, that's a challenge uh, in, a, in a single patient. How do you actually design a, an opportunity to learn from that patient in an effective fashion? At all age groups are represented. All gene families are represented. Uh, and we have, as we'll show you, meaningful evidence of benefit in some patients. We can't guarantee benefit. There's nothing we can guarantee. But to have already evidence of meaningful improvement in patients is, is a tremendously important step for the field. Um, we know now that different mutations, can, uh, the same mutation can produce different phenotypes. Different mutations can produce the same phenotype. And what we see is what I describe as phenotype drift, these changing phenotypes over time. We think that's important. And, and we think that there are things to be learned about why that happens and how it happens and what we do when we intervene. Um, and that, that managing patients professionally while they're on experimental treatment is critical, particularly if you do have a surprising adverse or serious adverse event, to be sure to understand that and make that aware, uh, make that apparent to the community as rapidly uh, as possible is really critical. Um, we're not simply interested in the patient. We know that, that patients should be considered holistically and that they're a part of families. And so we've done our best to begin to create a community for the NanoRare. And, and that includes uh, sort of the centerpiece is this podcast series we've done that I, that I host, which has been great fun for me. Lots of very interesting interviews. And then these little lectures where I take people from what is a chemical to on to the most complicated sort of biological questions. That's in response to what I see as remarkable achievement by people who have no scientific training. What could they achieve if they understood more? Uh, I'm told by people who know about this stuff that the response has been very good since I don't even text. It's hard for me to judge, but uh, um, I'm told these numbers are, are fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I shouldn't admit to being such a Luddite, but I am. Um, and we're sharing what we learn. Um, I personally have given, I don't know, hundreds of presentations. We give presentations constantly. Uh, and, and we think the right way to share scientific information is in peer-reviewed journals. Here's our peer-reviewed publications to date. The manuscript on the 173 patients is submitted, and so I'm hopeful that in, in pretty soon, you should be able to look at that manuscript yourself and learn what you, could, what you want to learn from the work that we're doing. Um, last week, uh, we announced a, a partnership with St. Jude that we think may be transformative or certainly a, a, a partnership that model that could be transformative for our patients. All of you know St. Jude as, as a great research uh, facility that's pioneered uh, the advances in treatment in pediatric cancer. And great news for many of you, St. Jude has now added severe pediatric neurological diseases to its portfolio. This partnership includes us uh, preparing uh, ASOs for two patients to, uh, that St. Jude, but it's open-ended, we could do more. It also includes us training St. Jude to uh, discover and develop ASOs as we do, as we've learned at Iona's. And we think that that's a model that then we can export to others. Um, and, and that can get even more patients treated um, with high quality ASOs. And so it's a model that we hope to export to other organizations as a way of leveraging, leveraging what we know and what we're learning and getting more patients treated. Um, one question that I've been asked is, are you really justified in treating a single patient? Is, is all this effort really justified? Uh, that's a sort of an unsophisticated way of saying, what's the return on investment in what we're doing with, with, with patients like, like nanorare patients? And I think the return on investment is going to be really quite extraordinary. First, if you think about the number of patients that we suspect exist with nanorare diseases, certainly millions. Uh, just reducing the burden on the healthcare system uh, of those patients is dollars saved that can be invested in other patients. 
But I think the single most important contribution um, will be what we learn. Um, uh, and as the tip of the spear to drive reforms. Uh, if you think about these patients, you know, every year we in the industry spend billions of dollars developing and using animal models. And there's not a soul who does that, who doesn't understand that every animal model has a flaw. And the flaw is, of course, it's not a human being. Here we have a group of patients who have the perfect biological experimental system for us. They have a single major variable introduced that's driving these enormous phenotype changes. And it's a human being. And we can fairly rapidly get to that patient with a, with a genetic treatment. This is an extraordinary opportunity to learn what we're already learning is incredible. What we will learn, what we will learn, will change the way we think about health and disease altogether. And that return, just that return alone, is going to be an incalculable victory for humankind. All we need to do is see it to the finish line. And in addition to that, of course, we, we can be a tip of the spear to drive reform. Treatment is always the tip of the spear that drives reform. As, as Chris said, when we, there was no genetic testing for SMA until Spinraza came. And, 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 other, and, and you see this over and over again. And then you can genetically test. And I'll come back and talk about that. So uh, what we see from NLORM and what we're going to ask of you is that you work with us to make NLORM the tip of the spear that drives needed reform in funding, in healthcare delivery, uh, so that nanorare patients are not left behind, not forgotten. So we think that the return on investment uh, for NLORM is going to be extraordinary. And, and, and we stand behind that. Uh, honoring patients and pioneer patients and families. Uh, one thing that the, the main point that I want to make is that advances in therapeutics are incremental. I mean, they occur in tiny steps over decades, often over centuries. Uh, think about cancer. Cancer has been a terrifying scourge of humankind since human uh, written history, and probably prehistorically as well. But we can pinpoint precisely the date on which cancer therapy began to change. It's 1946, a paper by Goodman and Gilman and colleagues. And in that paper, a, a, a gas that was used to kill troops in World War I, mustard gas, the, these authors noticed that it caused bone marrow suppression. And they made a, an analog called nitrogen mustard and reasoned that maybe if they could kill some leukemia cells in the bone marrow, they might make some leukemia patients better. They reported their results. There were a few patients who had transient benefit uh, really very transient, and most of the patients had terrible toxicities. And over the decades that nitrogen mustard has been used, it's caused incredibly terrible toxicities in many, many patients. But that single step opened the door, opened opportunities for funding, opened eyes, opened brains to think about, well, maybe there's another way we can help here. And what we've witnessed over the last 80 years is incremental progress in cancer treatment and cancer diagnosis and cancer surgery driven by that first observation, those first pioneer patients who took a risk and took an experimental medicine and really did take one for the cancer team. And, and even today, after 80 years, it's perfectly reasonable to say that gastric cancer pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, biliary cancer, um, uh, bladder cancer that's disseminated, therapy hasn't really changed. And so we have another 80 years of incremental uh, uh, improvement. None of that happens without the pioneer patients who are first. And so pioneer patients hold a very, very special place 
in, in, in the lexicon and the heart of, of therapeutics, as do their families. Same for cardiovascular disease. You know, the first cholesterol drug was 1960. It's called MER29. Unfortunately, it just caused terrible side effects and made cardiovascular disease worse. But now all of you take your Lipitor. That's a, that, that was a step. And every disease of every size, of every type, improves incrementally. And it will be the same for uh, nanorare diseases as well. Uh, Spinraza is a particularly germane example for this audience because SMA is a genetic disease and we designed Spinraza as a genetic treatment to correct that disease. And still, Spinraza advanced treatment for SMA incrementally. First, we had to begin by treating the most severe form of the disease, type 1. Uh, untreated uh, type 1 SMA, average time to succumb to the disease or require permanent ventilation, six months. I, I think about the parents who had to make that terrible decision of putting their little sick babies into our first clinical trial with Spinraza. Had they not made those decisions, there would be no treatment for SMA today. Pioneer patients and families. And then we moved on to a slightly less severe, not immediately fatal, but catastrophic type two. Then, armed with that information, it became obvious that genetic testing was appropriate. The guy got incorporated, and then Biogen was able to begin a study of treating patients before they became symptomatic. And today we know if we treat pre-symptomatically, many of these patients do extraordinarily well. And after that, more drugs to treat SMA. And second generation Spinraza coming. This is the nature of therapeutic advances. It begins with a single patient, a single idea, a single experiment, a single willingness and courage and conviction to treat. And that's what pioneer patients do in, 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 in and norm. And so we honor our pioneer patients and families. They open doors. They help us then do better with the next patient, help us understand how to better evaluate what the benefit that we're, we're making. They are, provide critical information that's going to teach us about that mutation, that disease, but will teach us about disease in general. And so this is a day when I want you to join me in honoring and, and admiring our pioneer patients and their families. They truly take one for the team. They take one for all patients with all diseases. And thank you. They are the real heroes. Um, uh, they are the real heroes. But in a very real sense, every one of our patients is a pioneer. We're at the frontier of science and medicine here. So every N, N of one patient, every nanorare patient who participates with us is a pioneer and is leading the way to advances in understanding disease and health that only these, peaches, these, these, these patients can teach us. We are so privileged to be able to serve such courageous patients and families. Heroes, they're the heroes. I promise a second, and of course many of you have seen this video. This is Susanna, she has a mutation in KIF1A which is a, an adapter protein that's involved in trafficking endosomes down axons. And if, if you can't do that, then your axons um, don't get the material they need and, 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 they, and, and, they, and they get sick. Um, Susanna um, had progressed um, before treatment to the point where she was largely wheelchair fast and nonverbal. I'm ready, Sus. Yeah. Yeah, and then what? And then, when, oh, oh my see? Look at that. Get up, you know, oh. you. That was amazing. I like that step though, but again, boom, yeah, ooh. Mm. Dad, come on, I'll teach you. How okay. to stand you up. Teach me how to stand up. She's a girl. I mean, she's going to teach you how to stand up, right? Um, 
And oh yeah, now she's playing ball. So Susanna is Wendy Chung's patient, formerly of Columbia, now at Harvard. Um, you know, I'm not a pediatric neurologist, but to my untrained eye, what impresses me about Susanna is she seemed to be improving in multiple domains. And, you know, she has a chronic pain syndrome, difficult to measure, but her parents, who are the best observers, are confident that that's improved as well. And Lori will show you other examples, but to have any example in having just treated a half a dozen patients long enough to have evidence of benefit, I think is an extraordinary statement. And it's a statement of hope. It's a statement of futures created where futures did not exist. So that's what NLARM is. It's about creating futures. So um, I think um, that if we can come together as a unified, knowledgeable, committed community where our patients and families are united together with the great people that we have at NLORM, our extraordinary partners and donors and, 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 and all the supporters we have, there's really nothing we can't achieve. And I do believe that we can change the world one patient, one family at a time. I commend that journey to you. Thank you very much.